Pranam Da. Good afternoon. Um, I should just say this, that climate change is happening and we collectively can't stop it. So with that damning indictment, um, how do you work to mitigate its worst impacts? Um, the TV and film production industry um, must play its part. It has to play its part. But how? So welcome, Croeser, um, to this RTS Cymru Wales special event. Uh, we've titled it Cop a Load of This, and you can sort of see what we did there. Um, and if you can't see what we did there, you've not been paying attention to the news of late. Um, so time to coincide with COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference taking place in Glasgow right now, this minute, where Joe Finnan is actually in Glasgow right now. Um, COP, of course, is Conference of the Parties, um, this being its 26th meeting. Uh, my name is Owen Williams. I'm an RTS Company board member and MD of social media agency Simul. And I am thrilled, uh, delighted, ecstatic uh, to be joined by a distinguished panel of expert voices, all of whom will take themselves off mute when they speak in order to keep things flowing. Um, and each one is, of course, working to create and instill change in their respective fields. Now, these four key leaders in the sustainable production environment and sector will explain their own experiences in uh, reducing their carbon footprints within their sectors, and we will discuss the climate challenge ahead. And so, without any further ado, um, because otherwise I could talk forever, um, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists in brief, and I forewarned them of this. I'm then going to ask them to give a potted history of their role and what makes them most proud in terms of sustainability, either professionally or personally, in one minute. And so, and so, Joe Finnan is the manager of responsible production at Sky Sports and, as she has just told me, winner of the second ever Green Award at the Edinburgh TV Festival. I would say that Roger is the first ever winner. He's over there on my screen. He's the first ever winner and Joe is the second. So I'm thrilled to have them both here. Um, Joe, introduce yourself in one minute and tell me what makes you most proud in terms of your professional slash personal commitment to sustainability. Go. So hi everyone, I'm Joe Finnan, Manager of Responsible Productions at Sky Sports. Um, Sky Sports, we started our journey on this really in 2017 when we started looking at plastics, removing those. Um, that just snowballed. Um, I was at that point working on contracts and working with suppliers, which really helped drive the change. So putting introducing sustainability into our uh, RFP process, working with suppliers over multi-year deals. That's, a, that's the beauty of sports is that we have multi-year terms in our contracts. Um, so we were really able to drive change. Um, and my role was created uh, last year in December. So nearly a year in this position. Um, and I think that is my proudest moment when it comes to sustainability because of the work that we've been doing, because of the drive. Um, so the fact that Sky Sports dedicated our own headcount to this to prove how dedicated we are and how much we need to invest in this is um, incredible. And I'm very privileged to um, have been recognised and get that job. Brilliant. Joe, thank you. Perfectly pitched as well. Within a minute. I love it. <laughs> and Sally Mills. No, no pressure, Sally. Um, Sally Mills is Head of Operations and Sustainability Lead at BBC Studios Production. Sally, over to you. Thanks, Owen. And um, Joe, congratulations on the award as well. Um, so I lead on sustainability in studios production, and I have been doing this for two to three years now. And we sit across around 2,000 to 3,000 hours of content, which is multi-genre, and we face so many different challenges, whether it's through continuing drama, comedy, factual, NHU, entertainment events, etc. All of it is wrapped under an off-screen strategy, which is underpinned by our net zero targets, and an on-screen strategy, which is underpinned by our climate content pledge, as announced last week at COP. Um, and nature and the preservation of it, it runs all the way through the strategy. I think in terms of um, 
what I am most proud of. This isn't something that I personally have achieved. It's what all of the productions in studios achieved last year during COVID, a really tricky time for productions, juggling and managing many things. They all managed collectively to achieve 98% carbon action plans in a really tricky year, which I think is no mean feat. So that is what I'm very proud of, all of our productions pulling together and engaging with this agenda. Ooh, we're going to talk more about that shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Um, Roger Williams is a BAFTA winning writer and producer and winner of the inaugural, the first ever, at Green Award at this past year. So last year, not this year, because that was Joe, um, last year's Edinburgh TV Festival. Roger, hello. Hello. Yes, uh, I'm Roger Williams. I'm a writer, producer, and I run a very small independent production company um, in Wales called Joyo. Um, we have made a uh, television drama series for S4C, including the crime drama Bang, which is distributed by Ban & J Rights internationally. Um, most recently, we've made a Welsh language eco-horror film um, called The Feast, which opens in the US next Friday and will be on general release here next April, I believe. Um, and the thing I'm most proud of, really, is going from being somebody who was genuinely, on a personal level, committed to making a change to the way um, I lead my life in an effort to be um, more sustainable, to, to, in an effort to lower my carbon footprint, um, to going on to make a drama series in the heart of Port Albert with its reputation for heavy industry, um, and pollution and um, changing the culture of the production to the point that we won that um, award from the Edinburgh TV Festival. Yeah, Roger, we, I think we need to talk more about that award shortly. And of course, Joe can add to that um, in terms of in terms of her um, in terms of her win as well. Uh, Greg Mothersdale is sustainability. This is the word I need to get, get out of my mouth and put my teeth back in. Sustainability lead and R&D producer at Clustered, the South Wales Screen Innovation Fund. What is Clustered, Greg? Just so just so our panellists and everyone else knows before we get into who you are and what you do. What's Clustered, what's Clustered sure. do? Uh, Cluster is one of nine clusters around the UK that are funded by the UK Research and Innovation Council and the Welsh Government in our respect for Cluster to develop research and development in the creative screen sector. That's the simple okay. answer. It's a lot more to now it. Now tell me about you. Now tell me about you. Uh, I come from a studio and production background. Um, however, two or three years ago, I moved into what I thought to be an opportunity to think about the blue sky thinking, or in this case, the green sky thinking, and try and find solutions to challenges within the screen sector, whether that's to do with efficiencies, um, sustainability, inclusion, um, new ways of working. So I have a production experience, but I'm currently looking into a new way of working within the media sector in a more sustainable way. Talk to me about what you're most proud of, though. Uh, working I set you all up with this one. You've yeah, got time to think about it. You've got about 10 minutes to think about this. Professionally, at the moment, it's collaborating. We've recently launched a, a Green Company partnership and announced three projects we're funding uh, this week, actually, which you can find out more about online. Um, but that's all to do with making greener choices in the screen sector more easy, more accessible and more understandable in a sector where it's very hard to make different decisions when you're still trying to get the um, content in the can. So we're trying to help the sector move forward in a collaborative way, which is what I'm most proud of professionally. Uh, that's with Film Cymru, but we've also worked with um, Creative Wales and Welsh Government recently. I'm also a trainer for Albert part-time, and I volunteer for the Gwent Wildlife Trust, where you actually see things in action in terms of um, wildlife surviving. I saw my first kingfisher the other day. I couldn't believe it. I've never seen one. And I saw three in the same day. There's a big, there's, that's my proud moment. It wasn't because of me, oh, that's lovely. just lucky. That's lovely. And I should tell, I should tell the attendees uh, that are here, um, when when we all introduced ourselves prior to going on live, <laughs> everyone went, oh, Greg, we need to talk to you. Um, so that was quite, that was one of my proud moments. Um, and now to our audience, um, you can get involved today by tapping the Q&A function, which is on my screen is just there, maybe different than your screen, um, and leaving questions to the panelists. So I'll try and 
uh, sequestered with 10 minutes at the end uh, of this hour to pose those questions. And if by any chance you want to say nice things about this event on social media, the hashtag is hashtag COP26RTS, Royal Television Society. So um, please, if you want to say nice things, if you don't want to say anything at all, just don't do it. Um, OK, so I was at a BBC Academy run uh, climate conference recently. And one of the producers and screenwriters of The Handmaid's Tale, and if you're not familiar with The Handmaid's Tale, it's this blockbuster dystopian drama um, series set in the near future uh, where the USA effectively defend, uh, descends into the dark ages. And Dorothy Fortenbury is that screenwriter and producer. And Dorothy Fortenbury spoke really powerfully about weaving sort of climate narrative and the climate story thread into her work. And she said this, and these words, I've written it down here. Every show on television that doesn't include climate change is a science fiction show. And I was like, yes, she's right. Because by definition, climate change, as I said right at the top of this hour, is happening whether we like it or not. So my question to all of you, and I think, Joe, I'm going to come to you first on this one, but my question to all of you is, where are, where were we? Where were we prior to this moment? What's the story up to now in terms of the industry's cl climate commitment? And Joe, as I said, we, we spoke recently um, and as you've intimated, a lot has changed. Um, you, your industry in Sky Sports, very fossil fuel heavy, lots of heavy trucks and rigs, etc. Can you talk to that a little bit for a moment and we'll, we'll bring the others in then? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, sadly, when I joined the industry 15 years ago, um, it it was incredibly fossil fuel heavy, um, driving around, it's a traveling circus, essentially just getting around the country. Um, we never really took into consideration the impact that that had on our crew as well, um, and how um, the, you know, the work-life balance of our crew, how um, we had, a, we still have, as an industry, we've got an issue with retention because of the the impact that that's got on people's on home lives um but from an environmental perspective absolutely it was um diesel trucks diesel twin set generators powering our outside broadcasts um we sky sports really started looking at remote productions internationally in 2015 or uh with, um on the uh lions tour but also on us open tennis before that um but we weren't looking at it domestically so uh, actually, it was very much focused on um, satellite uplinks. You know, we didn't have connectivity to a lot of venues. Now, at least we've got connectivity, so we're able to um, utilise infrastructure. But previously, the infrastructure wasn't there as well. But we're also, on your point about editorial, we didn't talk about it. We was um, as an industry, we the, you just wouldn't, you would never connect um, crickets getting rained off. Um, bad weather conditions um on on the tennis and um in in some of the um southeast asian countries where uh, air pollution all of that kind of stuff you would never have attributed that to climate change now we have absolutely um committed to using our voice more oh you're on mute <gasps> First one, and it's a host. I know, I know, <laughs> terrible, terrible. I'm on mute straight away. There's one thing I told you all not to do, and I did it. Um, don't talk about that yet, though. I, I want to talk about that, how you get climate change right. on screen. So, um, Sally, it's, it's Joe's experience broadly where you guys were as well, BBC Studios. I mean, I appreciate BBC Studios as a relatively new entity. So, uh, in terms of in yeah. terms of being independent outside the auspices of the BBC or the within the BBC group, but what was what was that like for you prior to this moment? So, I think um, it is look at, reflecting back. It has been a journey. If you look back ten years when Albert set up. A lot of the industry came together to collaborate and the focus went on off screen. Um, Albert was actually named after Albert Square because I know some of my colleagues in the BBC sort of created it pretty much on the back of a fag packet, you know, really, really quickly in a cafe, came up with the concept and then developed it across the industry. Um, so, and that on off screen journey around reduce, reducing carbon, making sure, which has now developed, we're all aiming for net zero. Um, that has developed very well in the last 10 years, but there's still more to do. What I think has switched 
very much in the last two to three years across our industry is people are recognizing the power of our voice. Um, the media's voice is incredibly powerful and the climate content pledge that was signed last week by a, a number of players right across the industry, including BBC Studios, BBC UK TV, um, illustrates that switch in priority and strategy. Reduction of carbon is really important, but so is the power of our voice. We know that our audiences, eight out of 10, think that this is massively important, but only one in four that was surveyed in August um, knew what COP was. Only 20% knew what net zero was. So there's a, there's a role that the industry has to play in just normalizing right across our content on screen, like the Soap Summit last week. So last week, some of our soaps in BBC Studios, EastEnders, Holby, Casualty, Doctors, they played out storylines across all of the soaps so that our audience can begin to see this normal behavior. It is a fact, climate change is a fact, and we're filtering that all the way through. So we can talk more about that climate content pledge Owen oh, later, but I think for me that journey just to summarise is off screen was the real initial focus 10 years ago, it is still massively important to reduce our carbon, but there's been this growing groundswell of recognition that an on screen strategy underpinned by this pledge is really important to our industry too. How is this, how does this challenge, how does this challenge evolve for you Roger from where were you right at the right at the very outset to where we are today, how is that how has that changed? How have things changed where you are? Um, at the very outset, really, I, I was a writer. So when I think back to how I was, how, how I was, I wasn't aware of it. I really wasn't aware of that idea of sustainability. Um, I was quite, actually, I think my carbon footprint personally was very low because I stayed at home, <laughs> worked from home before anybody else worked from home. Um, and I wrote and would email my scripts away and then a group of people would come together and the magic would happen and they would they would make the work so my awareness actually of sustainability as a responsibility within the film and television industry wasn't something that crossed my radar um, and it was only when i became i became responsible for the means of production <laughs> that i realized that I, I would, but I would just, I would observe, I would be on set and I would observe the waste. And I always had people saying to me, um, we haven't got enough money to make this show. That was a, con that was a constant ref refrain on lots of stuff that um, I, I'd worked on and I would get anxious and I think, oh God, we haven't got enough money, the company's gonna go bankrupt. Um, but then I would observe this waste and being the owner of the company, having that realization and that light bulb moment when I did some training with the um, Carbon Literacy Trust, where I went back to work during a shoot and thought, I can change this. I can get people to change their behavior. It's just something which currently, from my observation, it wasn't baked into people's, to people's practice. They would think about their responsibilities as a head of department, um, and they would be very, very good at what they delivered, um, but they didn't actually question how they achieved what they achieved through the prism of sustainable thinking. Um, and um, I guess what I started to do was to make people aware that we needed to be, behave more sustainably and actually realizing during my journey that that could save you money um and that was something there's, which a cost, went, there's a cost benefit to it as well isn't there ab absolutely and that went against everything that i'd been told when i'd challenged and i'd asked um and people because people are so busy you know especially in terms of of, of drama um it happens so quickly really um in the independent sector you pull your finance together um you have a broadcaster who is saying yes we need that on screen by september and then you pull your team together and you start producing. Um, so unless when you all get together on that start line, you are saying, yes, we need to achieve a really high quality program. Yes, we need to be aware of all our commitments in terms of health and safety. Yes, we need to be aware of using um, industry, 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 industry union contracts, all that stuff, which people automatically 
consider when they start work for a company, unless you add in, we are going to behave sustainably. Um, it was my, my observation that that wasn't something which was on, on people's radar. And I've gone one step further with the, um, with the horror film that we made hold that a thought. years ago. Hold that thought, Roger, because you're segueing into what we do now, which is what my next question is going to be. Okay. But I'm yet to, yep, I know, I know, I'm sorry, Roger, but I'm yet to hear from, from uh, Greg, who is this side of my screen. But Greg, sorry, Roger, Greg, I, I, I like the passion, though. I want more of that. Um, Greg, the um, Custod is a relatively new organisation, isn't it? It's a, it's a five-year-long project, and you know, I mean, it, it, these things, depending on the success, of course, these things get get continued or or or, or whatever happens, or something new comes along. But what what were people doing in terms of sustainability and training and and that and that delivery information prior to and the centralisation of information as well with regards to sustainability schemes? What were people doing prior to the existence of Custod? Where, where, where were we? In Wales, I mean, generally, Albert would be the go-to because they are the industry organisation for sustainability, which have got a um, broadcaster, particularly have a remit to work with them. So that would be the go-to. And um, prior to that, it's Roger's the perfect example of it. It's people who actually cared to take steps forward in this. Um, I think that actually there's growing momentum. And even on calls like this, and my um, hairs are standing up on the back of my neck, and I can just see that we're talking about it more and more. It never used to get talked about as a coordinator we were just trying to get the location agreed, booked, and people's socks washed at the end of the day by midnight so they could have them ready for the next morning kind of thing. And all of a sudden it's like, no, we need to start thinking sustainably from the outset. We didn't used to think about sustainability and development, which is really great news about the uh, planet placement and the pledge that was signed last week with content, because that is our big strength. Um, before that, when we were talking about our own carbon footprint and our own greenhouse gas emissions, they're reliant on the supply chain, they're reliant on other sectors, which are now innovating and developing themselves. We've got to think about what we're brilliant at, which is the content creation and how that affects the audience. So I think we weren't forward thinking before and now we're starting to be. So that leads me into the question, now we're starting to be, where are we now, I guess? And, and uh, Sally, when we last spoke, you suggested something that fascinated me, that. Um, the COVID pandemic, and I don't want to talk massively about the COVID pandemic, but again, we can't really ignore that right now. But the pandemic has actually worked for that acceleration of sustainability in a way as well. And I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about, around that and then talk about BBC Studios' commitment right now. Yeah, I, I wouldn't um, want to belittle the terribleness of the COVID pandemic, but I think in, yeah. in certain sectors, in certain areas, it has forced people to make change, and some of that change has been for the good of sustainability. So just to give two examples, um, in BBC Studios, we created the year the Earth changed. Um, Alice, one of our execs, um, brilliantly created it, basically, she said, from her bedroom. Um, and that, it, that increased the use of drones on the ground and entirely used to lo lo lots and lots of local crew, clearly, because of the restrictions on travel. And there wasn't a single international flight taken to make that show. Now, that is an extraordinary thing, given an NHU massive big show like that. Um, so that's sort of one big mindset shift. People have realised that they can create things without travelling, increasing the use of local crew. And that's not just in our pioneering areas of excellence like the NHU, because um, I know prior to that, Johnny Keeling, our soon to be head of the NHU, he was working on Seven Worlds One Planet. He was using local crews for that in every single area aside from Antarctica, because I think trying to get local crew there was very tricky. Um, so it was already in some of our genres minds, the increased use of local crew, but I think that's now filtered right across genres. People realize that they should be using local and traveling less. The second example I'd give is, um, user generating content, the use of Zoom, the use of people on their phones. Uh, sometimes people were a bit sniffy about this before. And actually at the very beginning of lockdown around March, April, Peter Davey did the big night in, um, had to turn it around really, really quickly and used a lot of talent literally in their bedrooms, in their back rooms, in their gardens. And it worked, people engaged, it got good ratings. And I think those learnings and that lesson has now filtered through to other shows, such as I know he's working on Children in Need now as well. So there's, quite a lot of lessons that people can learn and share across the industry to reduce our carbon footprint 
And that that's on, as I say, on the net zero off screen side. Um, but there's also all sorts of learnings on the on screen side that we're about to embed. But I know that's your future question, Owen. So I will hold fire and let you move on. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sally. You, you, you read the room well there. I love it. Um, uh, I guess it's the same question, the same question to you, Roger. And um, I mean, you won. I mean, and Joe has as well, just as you, as you informed me earlier, you both won literal Edinburgh TV Awards, the Green Award for your approach to sustainability. So, I mean, the bang drama that you made that is, you know, being, being syndicated across the world, what, what did that, what, I mean, you talked about it a little bit in, in, your, in, the, in the earlier um, discussion we had, but what did that look like? in terms of your day-to-day -day just baking sustainability in? Well, in terms of that, I think, unfortunately, during it was during the first series that I had this moment, I had the light bulb moment. And actually, it was literally a light bulb moment because prior to that day of Carbon Literacy Trust training, I had a real problem with people leaving lights on around the building. We had moved into an old magistrate's court in the heart of Patalbert, right next to the train station. So um, we'd started to say, well, we're by a train station. Um, why are we driving anyone here? <laughs> you know, actors generally, the sort of actors we were working with, the fantastic actors we had, you know, they're, quite, they're down to earth. They don't make these demands, but you know, we'd send a car for them. Um, and we just thought, well, let's just put them on the train because they will have to walk 20 meters from the train station to the studio. It's not that much of an ask. So we were doing things like that. But I had a real thing about, I didn't understand why people were leaving lights on all the time. Um, and I felt a bit like my dad when I was a teenager, when he used to scream at me for leaving lights on. Um, and I came back to the studio and there were all these lights on in corridors. The art department had lights on permanently. The security people were leaving lights on at night. It was just, it was just wasteful. Um, and I came back and started to question all this waste that I was seeing. The production, um, the production staff would, would print out call sheets every single day for the next day. And when I would be there mid-afternoon, there would still be about 20, 30 sheets of paper that had been printed out for that day, which hadn't been collected. Because the reality was that most people were using their mobile phones. They were being emailed the call sheet but we were still in this old pattern of behavior where we were printing it all out. We had paper cups um, and I went off and bought, um, went to Wilkinson's and bought 30 cheap mugs and told the catering people, we don't want your paper cups anymore. Um, so it started there. When we came to make the second series, my realization from all these learnings was we can build it into how we operate because we knew well, can, I, can i ask roger was there a perceptible cost benefit in the first series that you thought hang on a second these incremental changes we've made here have actually saved us money in these line item areas was that was that a part of the thinking or, or were you just sort of going well it, obviously there's money being saved here or could you see it I hadn't, I didn't have the realization until we'd finished. And then I thought, if we come back, if we make another series, we are going to do this in a joined up way, in an organized way. And it was down to the point because on the sorts of budgets we were working with, any, any saving was a saving. You know, we were making a show um, for 350,000 pounds an hour, a drama series, which when you compare to what network broadcasters are, are making making tv for you know is it's, it's a lot of money but in terms of tv drama it's a small amount of money so when we came back working in partnership with um the ex the excellent producer and uh, the production managers and so forth there was a real um effort not to move <laughs> that was our key commitment we were in this building in the middle of the talbot and we realized if we go anywhere, if we go too far from our base, we're paying for that. Uh, we are paying for that in terms of location fees. We are paying for that in terms of the whole unit being moved, um, caterers having to be moved. And we thought, because this town is set in Batalbert, and Batalbert is such a key character to the drama, 
let's make a concerted effort to stay within our building or just a stone's throw away from the building. So a lot of our savings, a lot of our impact in terms of sustainability was um, being hyper local to where we were. And there are creative choices then that have to be made. Um, I'd written the scripts, so I was in, in the position where I could make creative changes to the work so that we didn't stray too far from base. Um, and it was just that, that awareness is what I, I found, just being aware of what we were trying to do in that respect. Um, we, there were three key locations which were actually within walking distance of where we were based and where we were using this building as a studio as well and it turned it into a police station. Um, and there were days when I would see the makeup artists um, and the electricians walking out of the car park. And they would say, oh, I'm not taking the car, I'm not taking the car. It's just, a, it's, just, it's just a 10 minute walk. And they would be there with their makeup bags going for a walk. And you suddenly realize you've got the electricians and the makeup department walking to the next location together rather than piling them all into minibuses and taking them there with all, this, cultural, with all this stuff. Cultural shift. But, cultural shift, but also in terms of the social benefit of that, you know, that you are mi mixing people up in that way. And just, I got challenged, which was um, a really interesting exp experience because there was a sequence in one of the episodes where we were meant to go to London um, for about eight pages of the script. One of the characters uh, was in hiding in London. And I had this idea in my head it's all about the Talbot, but we will surprise the audience by opening one of the episodes in London and we'll see the London Eye and we'll see all those landmarks. And then we'll be in, in Spitalfields and we'll discover this guy in a tattoo parlor and it'll, you know, so I'd imagine that. And um, the line producer said to me, because they were trying to work out how do we pay to go to London with a, with a crew to achieve this. And they said to me, if you're so keen, on sustainability, why are we going to London? Why are we doing that? And it was, a, it was, it was, it was, it was true. You know, I had fallen in love on a purely creative level with shaking things up and changing the perception of the audience who knew this show and knew it was about um, uh, a steel town uh, with a beautiful coastline. Um, that we were going to go to London and suddenly you find yourself asking well what is important about this story and what was important about the story was that this guy was in hiding um, and we ended up with a much much better solution um, where he was in hiding on a tumble down farm um, up on the hillside near some, near some fantastically beautiful waterfalls um, and you get a much a, 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 visu a visually more interesting um, um, representation of the story. Um, not those landmarks, which you can probably see in, you know, kind of uh, one out of 10 projects on the TV every day of the week, um, and achieved our sustainability goal, which was not to, to stray too far from where we had rooted ourselves. And we very much believe that when we make the show, we, are, we embed ourselves in the community and we try as much as possible to, um, to, to use suppliers who are local. We try as much as possible to involve the local community in what we're doing. So we pull schools in and we show what we're about and we talk about the show, we talk about what we're doing in terms of sustainability, but we also talk about um, them as individuals who may go on to work in the creative industries. So that That's idea of... So you, you, you're pulling down the localism as part of the, the sustainability aspect. I guess um, the, the, the one, one person who's unable to make a play for that localism at all times would be Joe, really. Hey, Joe, because you, you've got crews travelling around the country everywhere. But you said to me that you changed... How you how you do the studio element, or was that did I yeah, did I understand that previous conversation? No, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I would say that yeah, we we do have um, we do have a lot of crew traveling, absolutely, um, and we still do, unfortunately. But COVID has actually encouraged us to use regional crew. Um, so previously, there was the attitude of um, we like this person, that person's going to travel with us. Uh, but that actually, because of the restrictions, um, like Sally was saying, it, you you started to reassess and actually, could you justify traveling someone, one of the northern crew to Wales? No, let's actually use our local crew in Wales and let's really um, encourage that regionality. So that has absolutely been one of the benefits. Um, and uh, but you're right with the remote production. So um, because of the infrastructure, because of um, COVID, that was just accelerated. We started looking at remote production in 2019 on EFL, so Football League, where um, currently we're in Cardiff and Swansea for Wales and um, obviously the other 70 uh, <laughs> Football League um, locations <laughs> um, around uh, England. And um, we, yeah, so we, uh, ramped that up in 2019 and COVID hit and um, all of a sudden yeah we had to do that on everything because it just justified um, our, still our presence on site but actually we were we were proving to the governing bodies that we've done as much as we can to reduce exposure to reduce our risk um, to the local environment um, and also making sure that our staff were safe and our crew were safe as much as possible. So um, remote production, uh, where, we, where we're able to, because we've got the infrastructure connectivity wise, um, we have um, embraced um, and we have, and that shows that we can reduce our emission, um, our footprint by the amount of people and uh, kit that travels by 50%, which is massive, right? Um, because of our introduction of remote production, because of our, um, uh, previously, in, um, we didn't know what our footprint was, so in 2019 we started looking at what our footprint was, um, and uh, this year we were able to introduce biofuels, so actually the way that our crew, sorry, our trucks travel to the locations, that what's in our generator is now uh, biofuel, which is um, hydro-treated vegetable oil, um, which is massive, it's, you know, it's our move away from fossil fuels, it's not the end goal, Again, it's, it's, it's a step to a, um, a greener solution, um, but we aren't there yet. The greener solution is to not have to get the generator there, to use the local power. Uh, but just to, big up, just to big up Sky Sports a second, in terms of outside broadcast, you are game changers. And that's not a, that's not a pen on sports, but you are, you are game changers. You, people, people are, you are, you are leading the field in this. But yeah. Again, another not another pun. Um, but you are you're ahead of the game. Oh, God, that's another yeah. one. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's really tricky <laughs> to oh. not be pun. They're all sports funny. analogies, aren't they? Go on. Um, sorry. But yeah, we we absolutely are, and it's. Um, I think Sally, you also mentioned it's about collaboration. So we we of course I'm very competitive. I want to be the first. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't the first to win the Green Award. Roger nicked that, but um, <laughs> I then stole it off him. <laughs> um, but yeah, we we want to make sure that um, we you know we can't solve any of this by ourselves. So we have to share. So as soon as we were confident in this biofuels, we tried it in Scotland to make sure it could cope with the weather to make sure that it was fine for live production we shared that with everybody to make sure that um if we can do it for a live production then absolutely you can do it on anything amazing amazing um i love the sport and i didn't mean to do all so many sporting analogies but I like the fact you, took up the, you took up the baton and ran with it <laughs> uh there we are um greg um what what are you seeing right now in terms of because admittedly in, in your role in cluster you 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 lead in sustainability. You organise sort of the, the Albert aspects and the. I mean, would you talk about Albert at the moment as well? Because I think it's really important that we mention what Albert does, um, and then the carbon trust and so on. You are you're leading that leading that area within within in, within the screen tech in South Wales. But what are you seeing right now? What's different? Um, when I first started this job, it was probably nearly three years ago, and it, um, I can understand what R&D in the creative screen sector was, research and development, and I was told to revel in the chaos. So I reveled in the chaos for a couple of years, trying to understand how we transfer it. And I'm bridging academia with industry now and trying to bring in processes to make ideas work, to take new ideas forward. And I actually think that more and more people are talking like we are today, which is way better than it was even two or three years ago. Um, You've got dedicated roles in production now, like environmental stewards, 
you've got sympathies for people who are actually trying to find sustainable solutions rather than it used to be that they were the nags and that they weren't really that welcome because the people had enough to do. So I do see there is a bit of a shift towards positive environmental impacts ambitions. Um, and I just want us to support it more really. And funding is gonna change. People are gonna have to start thinking about, um, I'm not an expert in all this stuff, by the way, I'm just saying that now, but they have to start thinking about the well-being economy and people's happiness and health and the future generations. So Wales has the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. These kind of acts and policies are actually gonna affect what we do down the line. And a lot of them have some brilliant ideas and plans for it. So I think that more and more people converging like we are will help the industry on a local basis for South Wales become more sustainable, but also impact people internationally and across the river and across the bridges. So I just think that there's definitely still hope um, and I just want to try and find a more predictable way of taking these ideas forward. What's been really interesting for you, though, in terms of that, that R&D in terms of sustainability and the changes people have initiated? I mean, you talked in broad terms there about um, these type of tete tets being 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 run part of the course these days, as it were, another sport analogy. Um, what what are you seeing? I don't mean to do it, um, but what are you seeing? happening at the moment is there anything that's really exciting you right now um i think that i come to you because you've got your finger on the pulse in all of this you, you've get in and out of, of all these sectors i get about quite a bit but i'm not always the best at answering questions succinctly but i think that what i can see is the connectivity between the organizations so i've already mentioned film company creative wales there's screen alliance wales who are focusing a lot on young people and training bring them into the industry You've also got um, Green Regio, which is across 12 European states and the film funds that are actually starting to, they have been tweeting about it today, I think, with Film Cymru about what their intentions are for funding people in the future, because money does matter in any shape or form with economy. It might be a sustainable economy in the future, it might be a well-being economy, but it, it matters. So people need to know how they're going to be economically, economically viable in the future. So I'm actually enthused by the funders started to say they're going to do things differently and ask people what their sustainable commitments are. So the three projects we've just announced, they're purely to do with their ideas, taking them forward. Um, we're going to do research in the next year to work out the impact of what Chris has done and also what we funded so far and also hopefully develop better and stronger networks in our area to make productions far more sustainable. And where can people find out about Chris um God, i should know this just you should know the website yeah yeah uh, just i think it's cluster. <laughs> oh, God, just com. google just google uh, cluster com, com, the, com, the right way to spell cluster is next to greg's name there on screen c-l-w-s-t-w-r i can't yeah. believe you don't remember your own website address there just we go uh, moving on <laughs> where it will hate me but just there's an email address get in touch and i'll happily help <laughs> if i can oh you're you're a star sorry i put you on the spot there um uh, although I just assume you know. Um, <laughs> we've got about seven okay. minutes before we go into questions. <laughs> it depends whether we get any questions, really. We've got, see, see, we've got one here, but if you want to ask a question, this goes to the audience now, not the panelists, because we're just going to do that ourselves. Um, but if you want to ask any questions, there's a Q&A button below. It's below here on my screen, but it, it's Q&A, not chat, not raise hands, just go to Q&A and we'll, we'll, we'll tackle those questions. But we've got about six or seven minutes to sort of sort of wrap up um, things. We, my God, we, we, we may stray into that last 10 minutes now. We'll see how we go. Um, but I want to ask you all, and you can all put your mics on for this one, but where are we going? What's next? What does what does climate success look like? Admittedly, it's it's you know it's not raising the temperature above one point five Celsius, but the world has got to deal with that. But what can you know in our areas? What does success really look like, and what are we doing, and what can we what can we achieve, and what, what what's next? So a very open question, and that essentially goes to all of you. Let's let's pick out someone, Roger. Um. Well, gosh. Okay. Um. I. For me, on a, on a personal level, it's it's now built into what I do, to the point where you find yourself asking, well, what else can we, can, what else can we do? Um, and I know I have gaps, I have gaps in my knowledge and my practice when it comes to the technology, um, and this kind of question just in terms of where in the world I produce my work, 
whether the suppliers are there to be able to supply green generators um and when we need vehicles you know those those green whether vehicles. joe has pinched them all on their productions yeah yeah they're all up in uh all up in manchester covering the football but <laughs> you know they're they're you know so there's that sort of there's that kind of space which you know i need to i need to understand better and need to um need to research and the sharing of information around that when it comes to the indie sector you know that's the thing you know because we are the indie sector and you'll be aware Owen, in terms of wales you know it's really fragmented the companies often are just individuals who are running who, who are running companies um very often uh, yeah so and, and can, even the even the super users. indies can be quite siloed internally yeah. as well so it's it's a fractious thing isn't it yeah but you know one of the areas that i'm personally interested in as well is how you know, as creative people, as writers, how we can build in sustainability within the narratives and within what we are ultimately trying to say with our, with our dramas. So I mentioned earlier that we made um, an eco-horror film. Um, and that came after Bang. So it was with all the learning that we'd had from Bang about how we can embed ourselves in one place and do as much of it well, all of it actually, in that case, hyper locally with all the learning that we had. But of course, at the heart of it, there is a message about um, the individual's relationship to the earth. And it's literally the earth um, in the film and how the earth takes revenge on um, a family who have betrayed that earth. Um, and that's interesting to me because it's a tricky thing to get right. It's, a, I, think, I think creatively, how you can how you can challenge or challenge audiences within the narrative of what you're doing um, in drama because it can feel clunky it can feel like something that's added on um, and all of these things I think you know ultimately um, there is a responsibility from the funders and from the broadcasters to prompt people to almost give people permission or to challenge them to do that um and i think that you know i think some of the funders some of the broadcasters they they don't need they shouldn't be so they shouldn't be so shy about ex having that expectation of producers and creative people yeah. um that we've got those things behind the scenes but also we should be seeing it on screen and that's a tricky thing in drama but it's not impossible and um just to add from to that sky um we as a commissioner we have the planet test so we anything that we commission, we expect there to be a, a, an obviously where possible, if it's period drama, that might be a bit trickier, but um, if, uh, wherever possible, we expect there to them to be incorporate climate change within the storyline. And we had a report that was issued, um, I think last week that said, um, the research finds that eight in 10 support the idea of broadcasters nudging green choices through content. One in three say that TV has inspired them to make changes. So um sky acknowledged that and i'm sure sally you the report that you issued it says similar things but um and from a sports perspective we we know that we've actually got a really unique um audience around the our editorial so our editorial um our customers aren't necessarily that engaged with climate change um so but we've got the opportunity to uh weave it into our narrative um to the the disengaged population. So um, actually to highlight when when we're at these venues that they will be flooded um, in by in a certain amount of a couple of decades, that um, air pollution has stopped play, that storms have stopped play. All of these things actually are authentic. We, uh, we, are, we were the first uh, broadcaster to sign up to UNFCCC, Sports for a Climate Action, which commits us to using our voice on air. Um, to talk about this where relevant we're not going to talk about it every match or every formula one race but where it's relevant when we've got a vegan player or where we've got an issue with the weather where we you know the, the stadium floods or the state or nice stories as well where there's um solar panels on the roof or the club is doing something or the players are doing something brilliant and this there is local schemes and initiatives we want to talk about it because it is so important so i i completely agree with you joe i think um 
one minute on the on screen and one minute on the off screen, Owen, from me, I think on the on screen, um, it's operationalizing the pledge that was announced last week, um, which had six commitments underneath it. But importantly, it's sort of focusing on all the support that our production community and our production individuals need to um, understand the science and understand what audience want, and then crucially to measure our impact. So as an industry, starting with the third, actually, as an industry, we are working with BAFTA to find a way of measuring the impact of the power of our voice. So in normalizing or portraying sustainability across all of our content on screen, um, how has that made a change in audience behavior? How has that turned the dial from a climate change point of view? So at the moment, I know that, um, you know, the one show had a, an article with Zoe Ball and the bees. Um, we had um, electric car races in Top Gear. We've got it filtered all the way through our programs, but really, really linking that to whether it made a difference is what the industry is now working on. So there's a measurement piece. Um, also, as I say, on on screen, it's about understanding, helping our community understand the editorial sort of the impact of the science so um, lots of surveys that have been done that Joe will be across but for example I think um, Ipsos Mori did a survey where they said they listed nine actions and they asked audiences to rate which they thought was the most important from a carbon impact point of view and everybody went with the tangible so everybody said it's all about recycling and they put that as the top carbon reduction action um, People like to go with tangible objects, where in fact, in that survey, in the list of the nine items, it was, you know, it was all about travel, reduce, reducing international travel, renewable energy. I think it was having one fewer children, things a little bit more controversial, um, but that's the sort of what the survey said. So I think it's understanding the science, understanding your audience. You're not shoehorning stories in, just as Joe says, it's got to feel natural. So in EastEnders, we've got a character, Bailey. She, she's, she's a bit of an eco-warrior, always has been. It's just sort of a way of life for her. Um, and I think all of the soaps across the industry dealt with it brilliantly last week. That's my on-screen. Very, very quickly on off-screen, I think um, it's about continuing to raise the bar. So taking the stuff that Roger's doing and thinking, okay, what's the next baseline? Next time we do it, what will we do that's a little bit better? Um, understanding the science and the impact of what you're doing, pioneering approaches. So wind to watch using their green energy uh, generator, then rolling that out across the industry, sharing it with everybody else. Um, even, even small stuff, you know, the more glamorous stuff like strictly I think have 95% of their special effects is biodegradable and Earthshot Prize the presenters were wearing pre-loved clothes it's just making people aware of that and celebrating it when you have these little nuggets that a production does celebrating it um, across the industry and then people will continue to do more so that was it that was my well, on-screen and off-screen piece no of course thank you it was all that trickle down I've got some questions here so we've got about seven minutes left so we're going to take your questions if that's okay sorry Greg but I think this question is particularly for you Greg Catherine the Bad Fox um I don't know if that's the Bad Wolf's little brother I'm not entirely sure but uh, or Bad Little Sister I'm very excited to be listening to this wonderful conversation thank you Catherine I wanted to ask um as I'm writing an episodical tv series that directly talks about climate change and what the impact we're having on the earth. It's a thriller, but addresses global issues. I've always, um, I've always, as an independent, looked at how we've more, more sustainable production, I have attended the Albert Coles, but could you advise, if there is any help to smaller productions, any funding to help? Um, now, I know, Greg, you're not a funding expert, but I do know that you've got some, some thoughts in that regard, um, or you might be able to help, but Roger certainly might be able to assist with that one. Um, I would love to have it, if we can make this production as green and sustainable as it could possibly be. Well, hopefully, Catherine, some of these questions have been answered by, by people like Roger already. Um, uh, does anyone want to touch on what Catherine's asking there? And you can see that in your Q&A function if you, if you want to get a better sense of what Catherine said there. I think initially start with the organisations we've already mentioned today because they're the great signposters. So Albert, for instance, is a good point of contact to ask first. Um, film company recently have employed a green manager and they have very much, this is in Wales, so I'm sorry this is a little bit... Um, yeah, no, I, I don't know if Catherine's located, but, um, but yeah, yeah, it, if you're in Wales, certainly but the film company Wales can be accessed. The funders are starting to think like this, whether it's actually specifically for script development, I don't know, whether it's production development, I'd probably need a bit more information. But um, the, there are funders around Europe that are announcing what they're intending to do in the, next, in the next few years. So do keep track of the individual film funds. With TV series, follow the broadcasters. Um, 
in my area, research and innovation, there's an organisation called UKRI. They have a fund finder, a grant finder online. Um, and that's very specific to do with transport, for instance. But they are also starting to um, work with the creative economy. So they recently did a pilot launch of a fund all around the creative industry because our economy has grown so much. It's one of the strongest economies in the UK and the future thinking. So they are starting to go from a more traditionally research oriented, oriented, oriented sector into a creative research oriented sector. So UKRI, have a look at them online. Um, if people want to get in touch after I and just um, I'll, I'll respond to them after the call. But sure, uh, sure, sure, sure. Probably early days to be as specific to what Catherine asked, but I think in the next couple of years, there'll be more and more in that area. Do any of the rest of the panel have any thoughts on Catherine's question there? Um, yeah, I just say, you know, I I would um, just 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 make sure the scripts are as strong as they possibly can be, because then I think in terms of the money you need to produce it, that will come, that will that will flow. Something that is absolutely true about all the broadcasters is that they want the most exciting, um, most relevant ideas that are out there. Um, so in terms of what you're presenting them, if it's strong, if it's good, if the story is compelling, um, I don't think you'll have a problem financing it because one of the uh, big companies like Netflix, who've got a lot of experience actually about making drama series which are um, set in a number of different countries, um, would absolutely, absolutely jump on it. I'll just add two things as um, well, actually. Go um, there's free training at BAFTA as well that you should take both production management and editorial word training and the second thing is just again going back to the pledge last week I am not um, representing a broadcaster here I'm representing the studio's production company but what was clearly set out in the pledge is that um, there is um, a will within commissioners to look for solution focused and positive um, sustainable stories as well so just bear that in mind I think people are, are looking for um, they don't want audiences to turn off because they have climate anxiety or they're you know worried that it's all faceless they go, oh, I can't do anything. They are also actively looking and have been saying that they are actively looking for that positive solution focused approach to sustainability. So again, I'm saying that is just what the pledge says. I'm not speaking for any particular broadcaster there. Well, I tell you what, you can speak now for the broadcaster, uh, not, not for the broadcaster, sorry, we even speak for BBC News Production because there is a question from an anonymous attendee and I think that is... Oh, anonymous is dangerous. How, I know, exciting, isn't it? It's like the, the, the man from Milk Tray. Um, Sally, I know when to watch use green hydrogen. Do you see this as being important going forward? I'm going to preempt that with probably yes, absolutely. Yes. But I'll, I'll pitch it to you, Sally. Yes, I think the answer is yes. So Helen Wallbank, the PM, pioneered this for Winter Watch at the beginning of last year. It's now rolled out across the other watches, so Spring Watch, etc. I think it's really important. I think it was. Um, as I said, in terms of our sort of operations in making programmes in BBC Studios, we have people that are pioneering at the top, like Helen and that green energy piece around. And then we have um, everybody else in the middle that we're trying, we're constantly trying to lift the bar. I think in terms of when we find a solution that works and that is pioneering, we will try and increase the volume of it, not just within our area, but across the industry as well. So I think, um, yes, it's a good thing. And that's been proven by the fact that the watches are continuing to use it. Are you seeing that cost saving? Um, well, look, I, I was going to sort of, in terms of figures, because I was thinking about this earlier, I think it's, I can't personally say that in the last year, there's been X amount of saving versus whatever and the reason I can't do that is because of Covid. I think a no, lot of the change yeah, yeah. has get, happened yeah, because of travel and it's hard to disaggregate what has happened. What I can say definitively is not travelling tends to be cheaper. Using mm -hmm. local crew as opposed to not flying is always going to be cheaper so there are definitely ways to save money. Um, reducing and reusing or simply not using in the first place, stopping the use of certain materials will always save money as well. So there are ways and means of doing it but there's a whole bundle of initiatives out there. And um, just to That's add that, Go on, so um, uh, everything that we do we have to make sure is uh, financially sustainable. Um, we've got 800 outside broadcasts a year. We can't have these massive, it's incredibly expensive um, things, although they are um, 
absolutely right and for good things to use we have to make sure that anything we introduce we can have across the board so everything that we have introduced is either flat or cheaper or like a tiny incremental cost we have not seen any sustainable initiatives which are incredible are incredibly expensive we just wouldn't do that um, we have uh, of course had a capex investment in our introducing remote productions led lights improving our heating in our building, all of that kind of thing. Um, but you see the incremental savings um, uh, from an investment perspective going forward. So we- It's um, a long-term investment, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So um, there, so anything that we have introduced is either tiny financially, cheaper or flat. Um, so uh, to make sure, so there was a question there around financials. Um, absolutely, this should be um, financially fine for you to introduce we wouldn't expect you to be introducing anything that is incredibly expensive it wouldn't work right we can't have we can't have that <laughs> no we're all commercial companies so it's just not yeah and on that note we're all commercial companies uh we are all we're all trying to do the best by our staff and all trying to do the best by everyone else and trying to do the best by the world and um, we are actually out of time um so it just remains for me to say thank you so much to joe finnan of sky sports to sally mills of bbc studio production to Roger Williams of Dyer TV, to Greg Mothersill of Clustered. This has been an RTS Company Rose production. Thank you so much to everyone again. Cop a load of this if you want to uh, leave a message on social media. We are uh, COP26RTS. That's our hashtag, hashtag COP26RTS if you want to say nice things. If you don't want to say any nice things, don't leave a message. Um, and uh, I just, once again, dear Gallen, heartfelt thanks to all our uh, attendees and to you, our, our panellists. This has been lovely. Thank you so much. You take Thank care you. of yourself.